Steam locomotives in miniature at the Steam Workshop. This is part 9. Working on a 5-inch gauge steam locomotive and on this one I'm fitting the coupling rods and the connecting rods. Before I start, I've received many comments complaining about the colour of this engine and I do agree with you, it's really horrible. It was a bit of an experiment and it's not going to be this colour. But please don't blame me, it's not my fault. I have nothing to do with the colour of the paint or the way it was applied. In the last episode, I fitted the wheels and the axle pump, and in this episode, I'm looking at the rods. Starting with the coupling rods, and the first thing to do is to make sure that both of the oil ways work, and that oil can get through from the little hole on the top of the rod down into the bearing. Coal-fired steam locomotives, whether they be full-size ones or small ones, are very dirty. In this scale, the coupling rods don't have corks in the top of the oil boxes, so they can quite easily, over a period of years, get filled up with grime and coal dust and things like that. The first rod goes on without event, and in this clip you can see some overspray from the painting operation on the slide bars. This is not an issue at all because I'm going to remove the slide bar, clean it up and put it back on. A very quick job. After fitting the retaining bolt and washer on the first of the crank pins, I've now turned the engine round and I'm doing the other side. But have a look at this. The oil way from the oil box down to the bearing on this one is completely blocked. But that's not the reason for showing this image. Have a look at the centre bush. You can see that it's off-centre. It's an eccentric bush. And what does this mean? Why is there an eccentric bush in this part of the engine? Well, it's down to the builder. There are three reasons why you have problems with coupling rods. Reason number one, the quartering is out. The crank pins are not at 90 degrees to each other. Reason number two, which is really bad, the slots for the axle boxes in the frames are not in line with each other. And number three, which is an easier fix, the length of one, or even both of the coupling rods could be wrong. Before fitting the coupling rod, I need to clear the oil way. I did this with a small drill and poked it through, and I couldn't believe how much pressure I had to put on it to clear out the mixture of coal dust, old oil and general grime in there. Because I've been doing this sort of thing for a good number of years, I can generally tell what the problem is. But the best way to do it is to fit both of the rods and see whether the wheels go around. I've turned the engine round, and it's time to fit the other side rod. I've cleaned out the oil way on the coupling rod and now I'm just putting some extra oil on it because it seems like a good idea. When this engine was first plonked on the bench in front of me, I had a good look at it. It was very rusty and in a bit of a state and I thought, oh yeah, and it's also seized up because the wheels wouldn't go around. But as it turns out, no, it wasn't seized up because once I got all the parts off the engine, individually they weren't seized up. As you can now see in this clip, the wheels move okay with both of the rods in place. And here I'm refitting the very thin headed bolt and the washer that holds the coupling rod to the front crank pin. And now when I try it, the wheels rotate beautifully, no tight spots, very free. So what's happened here then? Well, I haven't shown everything on the video. I didn't show you the sacrifice of the goat or any other things like that. Plus I left my spell book at home. Enough of that, here are the facts. The front bush, as you've just seen, was machined eccentrically to make up for the fact that the rod lengths are slightly out. And I would think that it was at the point where someone replaced the rear bushes on the coupling rods and made them far too tight a fit on the crank pin. So then with the coupling rods fitted, the wheels wouldn't go all the way around. And that problem, pardon the pun, coupled with the fact that the engine probably fell off the track all the time because the suspension's too hard, made the builder or owner of the engine lose patience and cast it aside where it sat very rusty and unloved for many years until I got my hands on it. Time now to fit the connecting rods, and as you can see by these clips, the oil is running freely, so there's no blockages on these. What I need to do first is remove this crosshead pin, but there's a problem with it. It's too big to come out the other side. The diameter of the head of the crosshead pin on the other side has been made too big on this engine. The general idea is you can push the crosshead pin out and it will go through the spokes on the wheel to allow you to fit the connecting rod. But in this case it was so incredibly difficult to get this crosshead pin out, I did manage to get it out, but it got stuck in the spokes. So in the end I thought, look, the quickest way to do this is to just drop the wheel set. So I undid the eccentric strap from the pump, then I removed the four bolts that hold the horn stay to the horn, then I could take the axle out of the way entirely. It seemed to be a bit of a pain doing this at the time, but it made the job much easier. 
So as before, I'm just checking that the oilways are clear in the connecting rods, and yes they are. In this clip, I'm tightening the nut onto the crosshead pin, complete with a galvanised washer. I coated the parts with far too much thread locker, so I've just wiped off the surplus. And in this clip, I'm refitting the axle set. And you can see at the moment, I'm tightening up the small 4BA bolt that holds the eccentric strap together. Here's the other one going in place at the other side of the eccentric, followed by using my Barco adjustable spanner and another ordinary spanner to tighten the nuts on the eccentric strap. I think it's time for a break. I'll go and see what John's doing. This is taking model engineering to the next level with John at the Steam Workshop. And John's still working on this beautiful tender for a 7.25 inch gauge Duke of Gloucester. And these are the cylinders for the very large 7.25 inch gauge 464 engine. As you can see here, the CNC machine has machined the steam ports. But not all by itself. John writes the programs that make this happen. And here's the CNC machine in action. It's cutting some name plates here. And these name plates have been soft soldered to a piece of metal which can be held in the machine vise. This is an example of a finished name plate that's made out of brass but it's been chrome plated. And look at the quality of the finish. Back now to my workbench and I'm very slowly spannering this very thin nut using a very small spanner so that it holds the rod in place. You can clearly see how eccentric this is in the rod. And OK, cosmetically it's not brilliant, but it works, it's mechanically good. It's worth remembering that this is a restoration rebuild, a sympathetic restoration. Yes, I could make some new coupling rods, I suppose, but then it wouldn't be part of the same engine. I appreciate that it's not perfect, but some things in life are best left not perfect. I use the logic that this is the way the engine was built, and this is the way it should remain. It's important, I think, to keep a grasp on reality. This is not like one of the engines that John works on. This is a very simple 040 tank engine, and apart from one or two slight anomalies, it's quite well engineered. I've just finished cleaning out these bearings that are fastened to the frames, and these bearings support the long shaft that has lifting arms fitted at each end and a vertical arm that connects to the reverser. So when you move the reversing lever, these arms go up and down, and this in turn moves the die block in the expansion link and allows you to put the engine into reverse. When I fit the valve gear, I'll explain as I go. I'm working on the rod at the moment, and using a craft knife blade, I'm very carefully removing some of the paint, and this is the part of the rod that fits in the bearing. And now I'm refitting the top caps. It's inevitable that some of the paintwork is going to get damaged when you do this, because, well, it is. No matter how careful I am with the socket, it's still going to mark the paint. So it's a good idea to have touch-up paint at the ready at all times. And here, with the help of a small paintbrush, I'm applying some of this black paint to the bearing top cap. So what's been achieved in this episode? Well, the engine's back on its feet, and it goes back and forth on the bench, no tight spots, very free running. And hopefully between now and next Tuesday, the paintwork will have been done. And what colour it's going to be is anybody's guess. As I run this small engine up and down the bench like this, it makes all the time that it took to get the engine to this stage worthwhile. After reaming out the coupling rods to be not quite a bearing fit and not quite a rattle fit somewhere in between, there'll be sufficient articulation on both axles so the engine should stay on the track. This is another view from above and you can see that the axle pump works fine and it's taking very little effort on the part of my left hand to roll this entire chassis up and down the bench fairly continuously. What's that I see by the door? Two men in clean white coats carrying a straight jacket. That must be for me. That's it for now, but I'm just going to show you around the steam workshop before I leave. In this part of the steam workshop, there are some jaw-droppingly beautiful engines. I mean, look at this one, and it's not small. There are one or two awaiting restoration, which are going to be good. And behind this one that says Walnut Creek on it, is a beautiful model of a 4884 articulated Union Pacific big boy steam locomotive. I'll be making some video of this in detail at a later date. But that's it for now, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.